Hello, good evening uh, to everyone. I'm welcoming you to this uh, wonderful conversation we're due to have at the moment with Professor Benedict Albensi from uh, Winnipeg in Canada. Now, um, I think we have a slight problem as his microphone has just been disconnected. And um, I think that what we'll do is just reconnect him into the studio in a few minutes and then that way we can get on to talking with him let me just see if i can get him connected again um so yes so just to give an idea as to what we're going to be speaking about so professor uh, benedict albensi is one of the world-renowned top publishers with regards to dementia research and uh, he has been working in Canada for uh, over 15 years and once we've got him back on the system we will then have him to explain a little bit more about his his background and the work that he has been doing over the past 15 years in in Canada and um, with he's, he's definitely one of those persons who is still able to get large amounts of funding. And this is something we will then look at again in some more detail. And so what we're going to do, we've got him here finally, perfect timing. I managed to speak my way through that. Um, hi, how are you this yeah, evening? How are you? Thank you, thank you for coming back again. Thank so you. I am just starting a little bit to, to give a bit of an introduction. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Certainly, so I'm a neuroscientist. I got interested in neuroscience neuroscience over 25 years ago. Really my interest began with memory and intelligence. And so I worked on a PhD in neuroscience and continued along those lines. And about 15 years ago, I started working uh, in the Alzheimer's disease area to look at memory impairment. And so we have a number of projects in my lab uh, surrounding normal memory and also how memory gets impaired in dementia. Well, wonderful. And yes, I think a lot of people won't realize just how world renowned you are because your university tends to bring uh, quite a few celebrities in, isn't that right? Yes, uh, in particular at our hospital, we've had uh, Bob Yeldoff and Steve Nash there for uh, the humanitarian award that St. Boniface Hospital Research gives out uh, every every so many years. So we've been very fortunate to to meet some uh, very interesting people. And you've also given an award to Mother Teresa, haven't you? Uh, Mother Teresa, Patricia Nixon, there's actually quite a long list over the last 20 years or so. Yeah. Wow, that, that's absolutely yeah. incredible. So again, I am honored to have you on with us and uh, wonderful to speak to you. Now, one of the questions that a lot of people wonder about is that they ask themselves, people who are doing dementia research, what experience do they have personally in, in the context of dementia? Do you have any personal experience? Well, I actually do. Matter of fact, uh, my aunt and uncle both developed dementia. Uh, and then my mother, a couple of years later, also developed Alzheimer's disease. So we do have, in addition to my scientific work, I, I do have uh, personal experience with my mother in a rest home and, and her battle with dementia. That's right. Yes, and that is that is quite difficult. I know as well from my personal experience with my mom, it, it's quite difficult to lose someone who has been an in, in integral part of your life for such a long period of time. Yeah, right. And it, it would be advisable for us to at least make some mention with regards to what's happening in the world on coronavirus. And we can't help but notice your name, Albensi. Is that Italian? It is. My grandparents were both born in Italy. My grandfather's from Rome, just east of Rome, and my grandmother's from Naples. Oh, wow. Right. And so I guess um, it, it's a very difficult time at the moment um, for Italy and Spain. And uh, truthfully, I'm speaking from the UK and our, I guess our turn may be coming quite soon. Um, hopefully uh, there'll be some places that are spared, but our thoughts go out to them at this point. Um, I've made a, a, a point that even in the midst of what's happening, when it's all over, we will still need to be able to focus on dementia again. And there's no point in forgetting it. That's right. Well, the good news coming out of Italy right now is that they did start their first clinical trial. So this is a, 
this is going to be important going forward. We started our first clinical trial here at the University of Manitoba as well. Uh, and of course, in some of these early trials, people are, are testing existing drugs uh, because we're, it's going to take a few more months to get any new vaccines to, uh, to those that need it. Yeah. And so when we were thinking of what we're going to speak about, uh, there are so many things that you, you publish on, there's so many journals that you're involved in. Well, one of the big questions is if you had to pick one area that you thought was quite important to speak about in the context of dementia research, what would you think is important to share? Well, dementia research is really going through a revolution. Uh, you know, for many years, I think for to uh, target any uh, chronic disease, we relied on drugs. And I think that our thinking started to change on that. Of course, the pharmacological treatment is still important, but I think we're starting to open our minds to other uh, treatment modalities. So, so for example, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, a form of electrical stimulation to uh, to send magnetic pulses to certain regions of the brain to activate uh, neural networks. Uh, we're going to see there's going to be an increased activity on, on diagnostics. We're learning a lot. Uh, there's several new blood tests that have been released. Uh, studies have shown a better accuracy and better predictability for determining what type of dementia you may have. Uh, even some, something as simple as a saliva test or a vision test or a smell test are gonna be used more in the future going forward to see if a, a person has uh, some sort of dementia. Yes, and one other area that does seem to be finally getting a lot more attention, and I've noticed it um, on LinkedIn that you've made the point and you're making a presentation about it, is that area of mitochondrial dysfunction in dementia. It, it, to make um, people understand, is there a simple way that you could put across what a mitochondria is and how this is connected in the context of dementia? Yes, yeah, so when one takes a, a biology 101 class, for example, we learn about the mitochondria. And what it is, it's an organelle in the cell, but it's a very important organelle because really what it's similar to, it's similar to the furnace in your house. The furnace in your house uh, supplies all the energy and heat for the entire house. And the mitochondria supplies most of the energy that we need for, for the cell to live and to function normally. So as we age or when we acquiring a disease, our mitochondria are affected. And sometimes actually uh, the impairment or dysfunction in mitochondria occurs very early. And this is very interesting. Uh, in fact, it was several, about seven or eight years ago that I realized uh, from looking at other studies that mitochondrial dysfunction in some cases occurred very early. And so that piqued my interest uh, for focusing on that in our Alzheimer's disease studies. And so uh, a huge portion of our laboratory work right now is looking at uh, dysfunctional mitochondria. And so, for example, one of the things that we've shown and we've published on this and we have other papers under review is that we see clear uh, sex-based differences. And so, in other words, we see that the mitochondria are affected earlier in female uh, Alzheimer's transgenic mice. And this is very interesting to us. And because of that, I received major uh, national funding last year to study this over the next five years. Wow. And so it, you've, got, you've got funding to do a major study looking specifically at the sex differences because women are far more affected than men, aren't they? Well, that's right. So, well, it depends where you live, of course, but in, the, uh, in this neck of the woods, in the United States and Canada, overall, women probably are about two thirds of those with Alzheimer's disease. And so we don't know why that is. We don't know if it's because women live longer. In some cases, we don't know if it's hormonal. We don't know what the genetic influence is uh, exactly. And so my study, along with others, uh, are looking at some of these uh, critical determinants. And so when you think of that, how does that fit in with the mitochondrial dysfunction? Is that where you were saying that um, there is a sex difference in terms of susceptibility to a dysfunction? Well, that's a good question. And I really, I don't know yet. I mean, that's the honest answer is some of this work is too, too early. What we did though, initially was to look at several age groups, two months, six months, 12 months, and so on and to compare two different regions of the brain and also look at males versus females. And we used uh, some cutting edge instrumentation to look at uh, mitochondrial function 
Uh, we're able to get real-time data looking at if the mitochondria have been affected or not. And we found clear-cut differences in mitochondria in the female transgenic mice as early as two months. And so those, it took a couple of years of work actually just to get those initial observations that served as pilot data for our grant. And so now we have to do the real work. We have to look at the hormonal influence and look at mitochondrial DNA and also do other experiments uh, with, we also use PET scanning uh, mm -hmm. to look at overall brain metabolism in our mouse brain. Uh, and we also have a clinical study that was recently funded and we're gonna be doing some PET scanning in humans with Alzheimer's as well to look more at brain metabolism, which of yeah. course is uh, intimately connected to mitochondria uh, and their function. Now, we, the, the world has seen some pretty big failures in terms of Alzheimer's drugs in the past few years. The, the most recent hope has been with Biogen and Atacanumab. Now, where do you think that amyloid, which does seem to be a big part of Alzheimer's, fits in with this mitochondrial dysfunction? Well. That's another very good question. And of course, we've come a long ways with our understanding of not only amyloid, but also tau, which is another pathological marker in this cell associated with Alzheimer's. But we know that amyloid beta increases uh, in the progression of Alzheimer's. We also know that it actually can uh, interfere with mitochondrial function. And I actually published a review paper, a couple of review papers and book chapters on this over the last year or two. Uh, so I would refer anyone interested to uh, look at those papers if, for the scientific details. But overall, there are specific mechanisms in the mitochondria that uh, amyloid beta seems to be interacting with that may impair mitochondrial function. So we are looking more uh, closely at, at some of those specific mechanisms in the mitochondria. Um, yeah. Now, I mean, it, these are such important issues because, as, as I think we'd mentioned just before, um, outside of the coronavirus pandemic, we have had a dementia pandemic that has been going on now and is, is, is increasing. When we look towards the future and we need individuals like yourself to continue to be funded, how difficult is that going to be in the in the current environment? Well, in the past environment, funding for Alzheimer's disease has always trailed other chronic and age-related disease. So compared to cancer therapy, compared to heart disease research, Alzheimer's disease has always lagged behind by actually millions and millions of dollars, if not billions. It's only within the last three years has there been some significant increase in funding in Alzheimer's disease research in the US. Uh, we don't see this in other places in the world yet, um, but it's still, it still actually is quite much, uh, quite a bit lower than what we see for other age-related or age-related disease. So uh, that's where we're at right now. But going forward, uh, you know, we, we can, we've seen several times over the last few weeks, the stock market crashing and going up and down. And so we're gonna have some serious challenges going forward with getting the resources we need to continue with dementia and Alzheimer's disease research in Canada and the US and other uh, major research centers in the world. And a lot of the work that is done is quite collaborative, meaning that it's not as if you are working in isolation. You are working with researchers around the world to look at different angles of the disease. That's right. So I have several colleagues here in Winnipeg, but I also work closely with uh, physicians and scientists at Washington in Washington, D.C., at Georgetown University. I have colleagues in New England, just north of Boston, uh, doing uh, writing clinical trials with them. I have colleagues at Rutgers in New Jersey. Uh, so I do have a variety of colleagues in the US and across Canada. And I'm also a part of a team in Canada, uh, the Canadian uh, Consortium on Neurodegeneration and Aging. And it's part of uh, actually part of Canada's new dementia strategy that was just announced last year. Uh, in 2011, the US came up with the dementia and Alzheimer's strategy under the Obama administration and, and Canada and, and a few other countries have lagged behind, but they now have uh, dedicated some funds to dementia research in Canada, and, and some of those announcements were just made last year. Wow, wow. And so when I, we look forward again, we've spoken about the funding, we've spoken about the, the collaborative research that, that exists. 
where do you think the future is in terms of us finding a solution that's going to prevent the dementia pandemic from getting even worse? Well, I'm actually very excited about the future. I'm very enthusiastic about uh, people coming together. It's very exciting to go to the meetings, the Clinical Trials and Alzheimer's Disease Research Meeting, the Alzheimer's Association uh, International Conference, which is supposed to be in the Netherlands this summer. I don't know if that'll happen. In fact, I'm supposed to be uh, co-paneling a, a committee on sex-based differences if that symposium is approved. But I, I think there's we're going to see not only pharmacol pharmacological treatment, we're going to continue with that and targeting a beta, but what's going to change there is that we're going to see the drugs being used earlier and higher doses and in more specialized populations. But we're also going to see an increase in other approaches. We're going to see increases in non-pharmacological approaches. I mentioned one earlier. I mentioned transcranial magnetic stimulation, and there are other forms of electrical stimulation that people will use. It's already been tested in some other indications like obesity, uh, schizophrenia, depression, and so on. We're going to see more of this. Uh, there's a rising interest in looking at infectious disease as a potential causative agent in Alzheimer's. There's going to be a lot of attention and, and research on inflammation, in particular, uh, looking at particular cells, uh, the microglia, that play a huge role in the inflammatory response. Uh, you know, normal inflammation is needed, acute inflammation is needed for part of our healing process in the brain and other regions in the body. But uh, chronic inflammation, like we see in the brain, uh, is associated with Alzheimer's and, and, and it's not it's not a good thing. So when we see long-term inflammatory processes in the brain and in other chronic disease, even in cancer, uh, this is something that we want to try to block pharmacologically, but it's not simple. It's a very complex uh, endeavor and we have to be very selective in how we block inflammatory processes. And so this is part of the, the devils in the details looking at neurons versus uh, astrocytes and other types of brain cells and um, and how we selectively target uh, important mechanisms in the inflammatory response. So there's a huge uh, uh, a, a variety of different areas that are increasing in their intensity across the world. And so when, when someone is listening to this and they have a mom who has dementia or, or a dad who has dementia. Is any of this, in a sense, close? Um, is this something that they can hope for in the next year? Or are we still easily five to 10 years away? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to put a number on it. I think some things are gonna pop up sooner than later, but I think five to 10 years, uh, we're, not, we're gonna be seeing new treatments. Uh, you know, we might see some uh, uh, surprising results in some of the uh, drug trials, hopefully, but probably in more specialized populations. Uh, we have to get a clear understanding of sex-based differences in males versus females. We can't just treat everyone the same. And of course, people have talked about personalized medicine in the past. We're going to see more personalized medicine, and we're going to see it in clinical trials. We're going to see artificial intelligence used more in clinical trials. In some cases, AI might be used for creating control groups. In other cases, we might see AI in clinical trials for more clinical support and decision making. So we're going to see a lot of changes going forward. Um, and I, I think all this is very exciting, really. Wonderful. And so as we close up this evening, and again, I say thank you so much. Is there anything that you would want to say as your final word to, to listeners? Um, what should or could they hope for in the in the future? What would you say as encouragement? Yeah, so I think right now most of us are focused on our loved ones, uh, those with dementia that are in rest homes and personal care homes, and I think we're struggling to figure out what to do. Uh, and, and, and so what, how do we interact with patients? And it's a time of great confusion, not only for the healthcare establishment, but for those with dementia that, that can sense there's something different right now. They might not fully understand the COVID-19 crisis, but they sense something's going on. They can feel that everyone's acting differently. So we have to give them support and we have to have patience with them. 
uh, just we have to assume that they're going to be confused and we have to be uh, as supportive as we can emotionally. Uh, also, if you're a caretaker, you're going to be under even greater stress and, and the rest homes are under great stress and in some cases they're locked down and and so we have to develop we have to use technology to our advantage we have to be able to we might not be able to visit those in the rest home and we have to be able to interact and continue our support system maybe with video conference calls and phone calls and this sort of thing um, we might also have to uh, have a larger supply of uh, drugs on hand for our loved one maybe get a 30-day supply rather than a weekly supply and uh, so those sorts of things. And I think that we, you know, they might not know on a daily basis uh, why they're not going outside every day. And so maybe that's not a big deal. Uh, we, we might have to repeat ourselves going forward that they're just not allowed outside right time, uh, outside at this time. And, and perhaps the best thing to say is that there's a bad cold going around. Uh, I don't think there's any need to really discuss all the ins and outs of COVID-19 with those with dementia. That's my personal view anyway. Yes, yes, I completely agree. Thank you very much for being with Thank us. You. Very nice talking to you. I wish you all the success in the future because your success is our success. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, stay thank well. You. All right.